Hello and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays from the Deep Carbon Observatory. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of DCO's engagement team based at the University of Rhode Island. This webinar is brought to you by Engagement and DCO Synthesis Group 2019. Today's webinar is the first in a series focused on synthesizing science, in which we're highlighting some of DCO synthesis projects. The goal of DCO synthesis efforts is to bring together 10 years of deep carbon science and share what our scientific community has learned and what remains known and perhaps unknowable about the quantities, movements, forms and origins of carbon in Earth. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenters who were part of the leadership team for Biology Meets Subduction, a multidisciplinary field-based synthesis project. Ah. Peter Barry, newly installed at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and previously at the University of Oxford, is an isotope geochemist and part of DCO's deep energy and reservoirs and fluxes communities. Karen Lloyd of the University of Tennessee is an associate professor of microbiology and a member of DCO's deep life community and also serves on DCO's executive committee. And microbiologist Donato Giovanelli at the University of Naples, who is also a member of the deep life community. Along with several other DCO early career scientists, Peter, Karen and Donato led the Biology Meets Subduction Expedition, where they spent two weeks in Costa Rica in February of 2017. I'll leave the rest of the story for them to share. But before I hand over the mic, a few bits of housekeeping. The presentation portion of the webinar will last about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into an interview portion. If you have any questions you'd like to ask the team, please type them into the chat and we'll address them in the interview section. The chat is also where you'll find some useful links, including the Biology Meets Subduction webpage and short film. So with that, I'm pleased to sign off and turn it over to Peter. Wow, thank you very much, Katie. So yeah, today we're very excited to talk to you about the Biology Meets Subduction project. Um, and before I start, I just wanna, in addition to uh, Karen and Donato, I'd also like to thank the other co-PIs on the project, which uh, include uh, Martin Damore, Taryn Lopez, Katie Pratt, and Dan Hummer. Uh, <laughs> I would also like to thank uh, the Deep Carbon Observatory and the Sloan Foundation, which who are the, who are the funders of this project and really made it all possible. Um, so just to start off, I'll give a, you know, th this is a very quick talk, but I wanna talk about the, the project goals and, the, and the, really the science questions that we were trying to address. And then we will show a short science film, outreach film that we, we made as part of the project. And then as Katie said, we'll just, we'll open it up to any questions that, that folks might have. So um, as I go through, Donato and Karen, please feel free to, to jump in at any time if, if, if you wanna highlight any points in my, in my brief presentation. Um, so the, yeah, the goals of the project, we, we were ultimately interested in determining the influence of any biology on carbon cycling within, an, within a subduction zone. And the place that we, we thought would be ideal to study this uh, was in, was in Costa, the Costa Rica convergent margin. Um, so you can kind of see where our project was situated. This was, uh, these are the, the sort of known hot springs, both in the volcanic area here and in the, in the volcanic forearc area. Uh, that we were interested in in understanding the, the role of biology and geochemistry on. Um, so we wanted to, to be able to measure what the carbon flux was, as well as any isotopic and biological compositions along multiple transects across the arc. So if we kind of come to this cross-sectional view here, you can see the various places that we're interested in studying um, from the volcanic plume um, and then outwards towards where the subducting plate is. And this area here was really the area that we were focused on, um, which is called the volcanic uh, forearc region, the area between the, where the plate is subducted and where we have outgassing in the volcanic arc. Um, so in order to do this, we, we, we focused on, you know, quantifying gas emissions in the volcanic area itself. Uh, so here's a, a picture of actually doing some DOAS uh, remote sensing measurements where you can actually quantify the amount of volatile elements that are coming out of a volcano. Um, we also uh, actually went into some of the active volcanoes and, try and, and collected some direct samples. This is uh, a photograph from, from our expedition two years ago, actually collecting gas and fluid samples. Uh, and 
as I said, but you know, the, we also focused on non-volcanic areas. So this is a photograph of Donato in the volcanic four arc area. And again, that's, that's the area between the, the volcanic arc and where the plate is being subducted. Um, and this is, these are typically cooler uh, water bearing manifestations where we have active degassing, we have active uh, water flow, but it, it ultimately comes from, from a, a deep source within you know, deep fluids, which are, are coming off the subducting slab. And then we also have mantle contribution. So in this, this four arc area is a really interesting understudied area. So this was uh, kind of the focus of our study. Um, and ultimately what we want to do is we want to, we want to be able to compare um, these on land observations with known observations from, from offshore. So we can look at, um, le we could, we could leverage existing IODP information. So information about what the composition is of the downgoing plate in the sediments, and then try to construct a holistic picture of what's happening in a subduction zone. So if we understand what's what's being subducted into a into a sub, into a convergent margin like this, and we can quantify what's coming up in both the volcanic areas, in the back arc area, in the four arc area, we can construct a, a, a clearer picture of, of the amount of volatiles that are ultimately making it past the subduction zone and then into the into the, the deeper mantle. Um, so in this initial um, study, you know. One of the things that has previously been understudied was is, is the four arc region, and this is typically because there's the observed CO2 outgassing flux in the four arc is is typically considered to be very very low. So this was an area that we focused on um, because we had uh, ample on land springs where we were able to get access to um, water and gas that was was coming out of the four arc. And of course, this was really interesting for the geochemists like myself, but also interesting for people like Donato and Karen who are studying the, the microbes that thrive in these environments and uh, are, are living on the energy that the earth is uh, emitting in the four arc. So we were interested in, in yeah, this, this whole question of, yeah, there's a, there seems to be a very low CO2 flux relative to what's happening uh, in the volcanic arc. And we wanted to know, is, is it because the slab uh, doesn't off gas until it, it actually feeds the volcano. So as the slab is being subducted, does the gases aren't released until the volcano, or are they some way masked by subsurface processes in in the four arc? Um, and so that was really the main science question that we were asking in our initial study: Is there a significant subsurface CO2 sink in the volcanic four arc? And if so, what's masking this flux? And there's a few possible explanations such as calcite uh, deposition or chemolithoautotrophy, uh, biological consumption of the carbon in the fork. Um, so these are some of the ideas that we've explored in our first publication, which has recently been accepted for publication. So stay tuned and hopefully um, all these results from our, our initial study will be in, in press very, very soon. So with that, that's kind of an overview of what we did in the project. And I just wanna share this uh, outreach videos. The bar that we have to jump over is to find new things about nature that no one ever knew before. When you start to learn the tools of science, you start to look at the whole world with this kind of curiosity and wonder about how things work. You're actually looking at the way the planet connects the dots. But the process is not always as linear as people realize it. Science tends to put people into smaller and smaller boxes. Our disciplines are really, really focused. It means we're looking at the world through a really small pinhole. And it's like everyone on the team is looking through a different pinhole. This is a multidisciplinary project. We have biologists. The water is filled with cells, and all we're doing is forcing the water through the filter to extract the DNA. And a group of geologists who are really interested in the chemistry of the volcano. This is what you want, cool melting pieces, stuff like this. We're able to 
look at the path of where carbon has been from going down to coming back out of the surface and how the biology is playing a role in both of those things. So with all the red that you're seeing here, is that a biological I mean that, or? Yeah, that looks great for us. Mm -hmm. Dark reds. We are learning about the gases feeding our microbes, and at the same time, they're learning about the microbes that are affecting their gases. And so we're seeing deposition from multiple different volcanic events. To do these two things simultaneously and, and actually collect the samples side by side is a, is a very unique approach. I don't think it's ever been done before, and I think we're, we're learning a lot about how the disciplines intersect, and this is a fantastic place to do that natural experiment. Poas is an active volcano. It's one of the most extreme environments on Earth. There's folks on this trip that have never even seen a volcano before. I am a little nervous about going into Poas. We're going to be taking a, a steep descent. It's a bit of a scramble down into the crater. It's very dangerous. We have a number of signals we can read that tells us about the activity of the volcano, but there's always an inherent danger. You're right next to this acid lake with like a few hundred degrees of you know, acid gases coming right out of the ground. pH goes from zero to one. It means pure acid. Man, that's strong. Interdisciplinary science can lead to great results. These things don't uh, operate in a vacuum. The chemistry is intricately tied to the biology. Science is about exploration. This is one of the reasons I got into science in the first place, you know, the chance to visit places like this. You don't get a sense how massive natural processes are until you get inside the crater. It's incredible. That's really pretty. We're modern day explorers. There's so much that we don't know. A lot of people think we've studied everything to its greatest extent, but there's so much left to study. There's so many big questions left. Um, so I just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions for the team, now is the time to ask them. Um, and while you uh, think about that, I'm going to start asking you some questions. Um, so Pete, I wanted to start with you. Um, you told us all about what you did and, and everything, but could you tell us a little bit about the inception of the project? What inspired you to even go after these questions? Yeah, I think it was, I think the, the project was sort of conceived by necessity in the sense that, you know, we had been working in subduction zones for a number of years and, and making these observations, which, you know, didn't, didn't make a whole lot of sense. And we, we had the suspicion that there was um, biological processes involved. Um, but as a geochemist, you know, unfortunately, before I started working with Karen and Donato and some of the other people on the project, I didn't actually know all that much about the, the dominant uh, biological processes in these systems. So, um, yeah, in order to better interpret our data, our isotope data that we didn't understand, uh, we wanted to kind of couple with people who had expertise in, in different areas. And so uh, we started to do that, and I think it opened up a whole bunch of new questions. <laughs> you know, after we started answering the, the first few, then a whole bunch of new questions opened up. So, uh, so what was it like preparing for something like this? And what did you guys do as a team to get ready to go out in the field? Uh, yeah, it was a little bit nerve wracking, maybe initially, because I mean, I had personally, as like a, a volcanologist and a geochemist, I had worked in, in these type of volcanoes for years. And I knew some of the, the folks on the, on the trip that do stuff similar to me, they had also worked in these areas. Uh, but I was a little bit skeptical of working with, you know, microbiologists who had never done any on land work before. And I was worried that there, you know, how, how difficult it would be to run a big field campaign with, you know, 20 to 25 per participants um, and having never worked together. So that was, you know, logistically, 
it was a little nerve wracking in the lead up to it. Um, but I think it was, I think it was a big success. I mean, we were actually able to accomplish much more than I think any of us had originally um, anticipated. So I think it was a big success. And then after we had done a little bit of work together after the first week or so, I think we kind of found our rhythm where we could, we could get to a site kind of like you saw in the video and very efficiently collect samples so that you know, I could collect gas samples and Karen and Donato could collect water samples and sediment samples. We could do it in a very efficient way and then we could move to the next place. So I think it, I think it worked out really surprisingly well. I remember maybe a year before uh, actually getting to the field, we were discussing how efficient we would have been with, with our sampling and we were planning for maybe one site every two days where uh, we were very pessimistic about our ability to coordinate in the field. But in the end, we did almost three sites every day. So it was very efficient. I had never worked on hot springs before, and I honestly had no idea how to sample them. I mean, other biologists had, so luckily I got to learn from them. So I just packed for my normal thing, which is to do deep sediment cores as deep as possible. So I had like three big Zargus boxes full of equipment we never used the first year. <laughs> yeah, and Donato shows up with one backpack. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, Karen, I want to jump back to you because this was, um, you've done a lot of um, ocean-based um, expeditions. Like how did this kind of land-based expedition compare to some of your previous field research? Yeah, I was really, it, it was really very different. Um, the rhythm of it is, is different because a lot of times on ships, you'll work all day either with a um, submersible or with coring devices to bring up the samples. And then you work all night processing the samples and sectioning cores into layers is a very laborious thing. Um, so really you kind of become nocturnal um, or just burn the candle at both ends. And this was, is actually a lot easier. <laughs> <It's kind laughs> filter your water and then that's it. <laughs> oh, it's kind of nice. Um, so one of the, um, one of the really interesting things about this expedition was that everyone was taking different kinds of samples, um, biology, gases, all these different things. Um, Donato, could you speak a little bit to um, the kind of challenges that this posed to the team? We so we were taking sample not just for the people present in the field, we were also sampling for a lot of other laboratories that are involved in the study but were not present in the field. So each one of us was sampling maybe six to ten different types of sample with relative protocols and so on. So there was a lot of planning that went into it. But then in the field we quickly realized that every hot spring was a different beast and we had to tackle that in a different way. There were places, for example, where it was best to collect gas sample first or the other way around. Maybe best, better let the microbiologists get their sample before messing up all the gradients. So what we, what we quickly converged to in the first couple of days was get to the area, discuss a sampling strategy, organize, and everybody will get into action very quickly. I was honestly very surprised how well we worked over time considering the challenges and the high number of samples we were collecting but it all worked out very well and i'm actually looking forward to the next big party big expedition party it was fun would you say that was the the biggest surprise uh, in the field that everyone did work so well together not working together necessarily because uh, we, we most of us knew each other from other ways we know we we, we, we're willing to work together. The problem is actually, uh, it's not easy to accommodate everybody's needs when you want to co-sample the same location with so many different sampling techniques involved and so many disciplines. Everybody is, is worried about different type of contamination or different type of necessity for their samples. Uh, I've been on cruises before like Karen and I've sat in through meeting where people debate for hours who's getting the first core, who's sampling the first layer, who's touching the first water that is getting up. And I found these on the field to be much faster than many of the cruises I've been in. So that, the surprise was how easily we accommodated each other on getting samples. That was, that was spectacular. Pete, what about you? What would you say was the biggest surprise in terms of logistics? Um, logistical surprises. Um... Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, 
Uh, Gallo Pinto. Say it again. Gallo Pinto. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it helped that people just kind of went with the flow, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we, we ate basically the same breakfast every day and nobody complained about it. <laughs> yeah, no, we had a we had a good group. I mean that that that's what makes a big difference. And I, it, it's not really a logistical surprise, but I mean I think how excellent the communication was 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 really key to to the success of the project. Um, because I mean fundamentally we just speak different languages, you know. We and we didn't even realize that we were so far apart in our fields until you spend a couple weeks together, you know in a car together every day, in a hotel together every night, at dinner, every meal. Um, and then, you know, you start to break down some of these, these barriers. And I think a big, big part of that that was successful was, you know, everyone on our trip was early career. You know, no one at the time, Karen didn't have tenure. So everyone was postdocs and PhD students and, or had just started a professorship. Um, so I think that, that, enabled people to ask a lot of questions that they might not normally ask. I think there's a tendency in science when there's a, a big, big shot old person who's a big deal and you don't want to sound like an idiot by asking a question that you don't know the answer to. Um, that happens a lot. And, and, but in order to make any progress with an interdisciplinary project, you have to ask those questions. Um, so I think our group was really good at that, saying like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Please explain it in simpler terms. Then you try and like, I still don't get it. You know, explain it in simpler terms. And that's, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but in, in these projects where you're drawing from all these various different communities, there's so much jargon involved in what you're talking about. You need to like really bring it down to a base level so you can actually communicate with one another. Sorry that wasn't a logistical challenge at all, but. No, but that, that's a, an interesting outcome that perhaps we didn't expect. Yeah, an important aspect of making that work is when somebody asks a very basic question in your own field that, you know, anyone in your field would know this easily, but you just don't judge them for it and you, you know, sort of respect their question. That's, that was sort of the attitude that allowed people to ask basic questions. Yeah, I think the key was actually being in the field together. You know, a lot of this discipline could have got their sample through someone else. And uh, I think spending time together is actually the key to true interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary work. You can do your own stuff back home and not interact much, except maybe for a couple of meetings a year. But that doesn't get you to really spring new ideas and collaborate. The fact that almost every discipline was represented in the field and was spending time together and was watching the same processes through different lenses really sparked a conversation and new ideas came up during the field trip. I don't think that's possible, uh, not spending time together. And on this, I have to say that another big difference we had in this project compared to many other collaborative projects, because there are plenty of projects that, where you collaborate through some disciplines, was the time we did integration session together with a larger group and the time the, the five of us spent on Skype twice a week, an hour every day, for a full year to discuss results. That's something I've never seen on other projects. The time commitment to discuss across discipline what basic results meant. They gave us a completely different focus on the results we were getting. Sorry. Um. While we're on the topic of um, the interdisciplinary samples and um, putting it all together, there's a question in the chat that I want to go um, from Karim. Um, my question is, how was it possible in the end to tie together the interpretation if some of the disciplines couldn't get samples in one location, um, but another discipline was able to get a sample in that location? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that is something that's been hard about matching up the data sets, but we worked really hard to make sure that we got fully overlapping data. And so for the most part, maybe 80% of the sites, we got everything. So we've sort of been able to do that that way. But yeah, but that's a huge, huge problem. And I think so far we, we have a huge amount of data and our first paper is dealing with a portion of them. There's still a lot that needs to be integrated together. And uh, I think it's going to be more and more challenging as we link more of the disciplines together. 
uh, and that's I think the how is possible is time. You need to spend a lot of time together because sometimes a process, a sample can get you information about the process that is happening far away from the other sample, but they're still linked together. I mean, that's what we've been doing by sampling surface, hot spring, and dealing with subsurface processes. And, uh, you know, it takes just a lot of time to connect the dots. Yeah, I think that, I, that, to answer the question, I came down to site selection. So when you're in the field, we would visit lots of places where maybe one of us said, oh, that would be great to get um, sediments here. This would be great to collect a water sample. And then another person say, well, there's no, there's no gas here. So this is not ideal for everyone. And we really tried, we had, we had limited amounts of samples that we, we could collect. So just the, you know, the, the bottle set that people had brought down, uh, the, you know, the ability to, to collect certain samples was limited. So we had to, we tried to, every time we used uh, those bottles that were so precious to use it in a place that we could all ultimately ob obtain data from that, that locality. We Can also we tried Sorry, we also try to be representative of getting high temperature, low temperature, acidic, alkaline. We, we planned a little bit ahead in order to get full representativity of the samples. And we also need to explicitly give a ton of credit to the local folks in Costa Rica who provided their expertise. I mean, this is um, that made the whole project so much richer, not just for the expertise of the geology and the volcanology of the area, but also just knowing where the sites are, like just the logistics of figuring out how to, you know, hike half a day through the jungle to get to this one site that was awesome. Like that's irreplaceable. Yeah, and, and, and that's, the area we went to in Central America was really ideal because it gave us access to, you know, as I talked about in my talk, like the, the four arc area, of course we have to go to the volcanic arc area and a little bit into the back arc. Um, but it was one of the main reasons to, to select going there other, over other subduction zones was these wonderful local collaborators that we had at the various institutions in, in Costa Rica, which as Karen mentioned, were just none of this would be possible without having such, such great uh, boots on the ground help us. Since we just touched a little bit on the um, science, I also want to make sure we get to this other question in the chat from Joy. Um, and she asked, does the accepted paper, I realize you might not be able to answer this, um, does the accepted paper posit that the bugs are driving carbon isotope fractionation and are they our care? <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, their, their biology is important. I mean, that's what we, we found, I'd say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll we'll uh, move on to another question. Yeah, for, 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 for a, um, a certain reason, we're not really allowed to discuss any of the, the findings extensively, but I promise it will be um, published soon. So that all, all your answer, all, the, all your questions will be answered, Joy. Yeah, no, we can say that um, it's not as easy as we, we thought it was. Biology is driving the system. It's actually much more richer and complex than that. And that's what the paper is about. Um, so switching gears a little bit, Karen, I wanted to ask you a little bit um, about um, you brought a, a graduate student with you into the field. She was brand new to your lab. Um, how do you think the experience is shaping her training and her perspective on multidisciplinary science? We, she and I have talked about this explicitly. And if she had just received this data set blind, um, polished, and there you go, now analyze it, she wouldn't be able to approach it with any sense of understanding or knowledge. But because she actually physically collected each and every one of those samples, she can really put it into context and understand how they were uh, collected, not just sort of the mechanistically, but also just just having a more visceral understanding. Oh yeah, that's the one where we had all those red biofilms. So, you know, that sort of sticks out in your head. And um, I just think that taking students into the field is essential. Um, it's essential for their training, but it's also essential for the science, um, for the research that gets done. And that uh... I'm sure for all of you being able to be in the field um, with everyone also was a, a really valuable experience. And so, you know, of all the different kinds of sites that you visited, the springs, et cetera, was the one that really stuck out in your mind as being 
super valuable to the work or super exciting to you scientifically? To any of us? Yeah, any of you. Yes, yeah, sorry. I like all the sites. <laughs> uh, I gotta go with the obvious one. I like POAS. <laughs> because, you know, until, until you vi you're visiting all these different hot springs, all shapes and sizes around, and once you get to the to the inside of a crater on on top of a volcano, then you realize how how big the scale of the processes you're looking at are. Uh, I don't think you while you're working in the jungle you get a sense of how connected these things are until you get to the top of the volcano, and now suddenly you start to think uh, why is this dot which is the crater from the map and how many volcanoes you got on the line in the area. And you know the scale opens up and gives definitely a different perspective than, for me at least, any of the other field site we visited. What about you, Pete? Is there anything that stuck out from the expedition? Yeah, of course I like going into the active volcanoes, but I also sort of like being in the jungle and you're kind of like hike through the jungle for a half hour and then you discover this this hot spring that's you know kind of you know hidden somewhere deep in the jungle. That, for me, that's, that's super fun. And then to look at some of the results coming out and to see that there's actually a deep source of the, of the volatiles and that, that the microbes and the bugs that are living in these, these springs are thriving on, you know, some of the, the, the deeper fluids. And they're not just, it's, we're not just looking at the, the jungle signature. You know, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so, I, yeah, I, 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 of course, like both. Every site's a great site. <laughs> um, so for anyone who's here watching this webinar or going to watch the archive, um, I'd love it if each of you could, um, we'll start with you Karen, if each of you could talk about, uh, or do you have a piece of advice for anyone who's planning um, an upcoming expedition? Like any kind of expedition or like a big multidisciplinary? I mean, particularly a big, a big multidisciplinary expedition. Um, bring extra sample vials. I know that's not very inspiring, but it's important. <laughs> bring way more than you had planned on just in case you get extra samples. Um, I think it's really helpful to keep an open mind and to be flexible and to not be totally disappointed if you don't find what you think you're going to find because this is not, you know, you're not doing this because you, you know exactly what you're going to find. Um, it may be that, you know, well, if it's an oceanographic expedition, it may be that your most important instrument isn't really functioning right. You kind of have to work around it. Or um, it may be that the sites are not um, what you thought they would be, or you can't get to a site because there's torrential rains and you just can't get across a river or something like that. Um, you can't let that ruin your entire expedition. You have to be really um, forgiving of the environment and reactive. Pete, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, choose choose people that you enjoy being around and who are stimulating. Um, that's one thing that we were really lucky with this with this project. We had a huge group of people, you know, 20, 25 people, um, and everyone was was great. I think I learned something from each and every one of the participants, and I genuinely enjoyed being around the whole group. So. You know, always, always work with people that you enjoy to be around and or asking good questions and, and, and pushing you. So that's what makes a, you know, science or any job probably um, valuable is to be around good people. And Donato, do you have anything? Uh, one thing that I have, uh, most of the science I do is through collaboration with a lot of very good people that are scattered around the world. And one of the things I learned doing early on in my own expedition was to, just before the expedition, don't just plan for your own sample. Get in touch with your network. You may access a location which is very valuable for one of your colleagues. It takes nothing to get one extra sample for them. That's what I do for every expedition. And we go into really remote places. And I think if you get into the habit of reaching out to your network and your collaborator, I get extra samples that you're not analyzing anyway, but uh, could be valuable for someone. That's definitely a plus. 
you're maximizing you know everybody's time and money and efforts and that's something something that i always do that's something we did in this expedition to maximize the number of variables we were measuring i would say that that's probably the single the single advice I can give to anyone. Don't just, usually when you're leading to your, uh, leading, the time is leading up to your own expedition, you're very focused on your own stuff. Stop a second, think about colleagues and collaborators and reach out because you may be getting for them a very valuable sample. That's a really, really nice piece of advice. Um, Darlene has a question for you all. Um, so Pete, you want to take it first? Um, if you could create the ideal scientific world, would you always go into the field with multiple disciplines? Um, were there any downsides or was it all beautiful and rosy? Great question. Yeah, I will bring mathematician and modelers with us in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I will bring everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I think that you, the more, the more uh, interdisciplinary, the, the better the outcomes will be or the potential for, for more outcomes. Um, and that they greatly outweigh the, any negative aspects of having a large, unwieldy group. You know, at certain times, you know, the you know the biologists would slow us down. We get frustrated. Oh, we could have gone to four sites instead of three today. But the upside is way better. So no worries. <laughs> but by being a big group of people with some overlapping discipline, we've been also able to split during some of the sampling. For example, a portion of the group will start to sample where we are and a smaller set will move upstream on the same river or close by and get to scout another site. That's something you can do all only if you have overlapping disciplines and a large number, number of people. Plus, I think that especially on the modeling and thinking, if you don't bring, uh, you need to see the processes you're trying to understand whatever your discipline is. So I think that could be beneficial for anyone. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that you, my ideal science expedition team would always be multidisciplinary, definitely, but not just anybody, kind of like Peter was saying, you have to get along, but also um, if you have people from really different fields who don't see the value in talking to people across fields, then that actually could, could not be great. Um, so they have to not just be people who are in really different fields but they have to be people who can imagine that bridging those fields is valuable and that's probably not everybody mm -hmm. i agree yeah or even possible i mean i think a lot of people aren't even thinking that there's any way to connect the dots between these various fields and i'd like to think that we're making progress towards bringing everything together so Definitely, I'm learning a lot of new stuff. I'm not sure what the impact will be on my career, but I'm, I'm bridging out to a lot of new concept and point of views, which is great. Okay, well, I think on that note, uh, we will say thank you very much, Peter, Dar Karen, and Donato for joining us today. And thank you for all you guys for watching. Um, we'll be posting an archive of this webinar in the coming days. So if you have friends or colleagues that you think would be interested, they haven't missed the boat on hearing these pearls of wisdom from the Biology Meets Subduction team. Um, please join us next month uh, when we'll hear about the Earth in Five Reactions project. Um, we'll be joined by Jackie Lee and Simon Redfern. Um, and that's at 2 p.m. Eastern time on the 20th of February. You can find more information about that and the other webinars in this series on the GCO website. I've dropped the link into the chat. Um, and as always, if you have any feedback or questions, you can drop us an email at engagement at deepcarbon.net. So hope to see you in February. Thanks, Katie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. Bye, everyone.